What was the F-100 like? Like, what was, how was that to fly compared to like the RF-4? Well, like you were <clears throat> talking about with the, um, with the uh, uh, T-38, you were talking about with, with Noonan about how it's, you got to fly it all the time. And well, the, the 100, you know, no autopilot, um, no radar. Um, you had a gun radar, which, but that, just for guns it was all it was there was no radar screen or anything it, it was a um, a plane that you could never quite trim up mm. to where you were comfortable all the time you had to fly it all the time and and you know you had high landing speeds um i think a base turn would be anywhere from 180 to 190 knots in base yeah. Final was 160 something seven plus fuel, whatever it was. Wow! So you had a pretty quick touchdown, yeah. and and it was an actual round out. Um, but uh, but you had to fly it all the time, all the time, and uh, it kept your attention. But that was a good thing because you had to focus the whole time. You knew you had to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. What was the mission? for your unit at, at this time with the F-100? Strictly air to ground, and it was a support, uh, ground support, and we had a NATO mission with it. Um, and as we transitioned into the A-7, we picked up uh, specific NATO missions and specific targets, and you would certify on those targets wow. here in the States. So you transitioned from the F-100 to the A-7. How long were you in the F-100 before you transitioned? Uh, what, two years, three years, something like that, two years. Wow, so they're just bam, bam, mm -hmm. jet to jet to jet to jet. Is it because yeah, they were giving yeah. you older jets that were kind of timing out, or what was yeah, the... Yeah, the, the F-100s we got were in mothballs in, in uh, Davis Mothin. Oh, wow. And, <laughs> and they would they would take them out of mothballs, test fly them around a couple of times, and then ferry them up to our base. Wow, wow. It was crazy. And... um they thought for sure that we would lose one or two of those jets, but we never did. That's awesome. We kept them, we retired them. They were good, good airplanes. Were you a, were you practicing law during this time, or were you a full timer? So I you're was. just a part time uh, drill part -time status guardsman. Wow. Yeah. How many sorties yeah. a month did you fly? Like, what was your op tempo for you personally? Oh, you know, we did a lot of late after in the summers, late yeah. afternoon flying four o'clock takeoffs, five o'clock takeoffs, something like that. So you would end up getting to the range and back before dark. Wow. Um, so you'd work your job but, and then just roll in, go fly your sortie, and it'd just be a long right, day. Right. Wow. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Wow. Here we have a, a rivalry between the Oklahoma State University and o University of Oklahoma, OU and OSU. And when we play a sport, it's called bedlam. And usually... It breaks out in Bedlam whenever those two teams are playing. And uh, in the uh, early 80s, uh, at the OU uh, 70s, late 70s, um, OU and OSU were playing, and I was not able to go to the game because I had to fly. So I uh, had arranged to make a flyby at the playing of the national anthem and like most games have a will have a flyby. But back in that day it was not that well organized. They knew I was coming in. They knew I we didn't talk about altitude or airspeed. We just talked about the time of the uh -huh. the national anthem. We went to the gunnery range, got rid of all of our bombs, did a good clean bomb check and on the way back come by Stillwater, Oklahoma. <clears throat> and uh made a pass down the field at the national anthem right at press box level uh, about 400 knots and it was a great flyby yeah awesome the problem is that um, um, I violated one of the primary rules of a fighter pilot and that is you don't ever reattack the same target uh, and uh, we went off and came around, and I decided to make a second pass on the first play because I'm listening to the game <laughs> on my, my radio. 
Yeah. So I decided to make this second pass and I didn't, I forgot to tell anybody I was coming. And we came in and I was really uh, at low altitude. Um, the statement was people, women and children ran screaming <laughs> from the stadium in fear of their life, which is not true, but I, but I had some, Buddies that that fly in the squadron with me that were at the game said they were looking down into my airplane, which I know that but they said yeah. they could read the gauges. But, <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but um, uh, on the second pass, as we approached the the initial end zone, uh, we did a break, and uh, that Whoa. would crack right over the stadium and make a lot of noise and and make everybody happy. And, uh, of course, my squadron commander was listening to the ball game as he was driving home in the car, and he heard the flyby go by, so he just turned his car around, and he was waiting for me when I landed. <sighs> Obviously, I, I was, was grounded for a period of time. It was a, a very uh, stressful time in my household for a while. Um, the guy that interviewed me for the FAA happened to be a former fire pilot reserve component guy. I didn't know him, but uh, he was uh, he was um, friendly territory. That's awesome. And I was very fortunate to have him as the investigator. Um, it, it wasn't good. But um, I was grounded for a while. Yeah. But you got an awesome story out of it. Got an awesome story out of it. Most people thought that I came by just on a whim and it was all pre-planned, but actually uh, was not, we didn't discuss altitude and airspeed. That's the only thing. <laughs> That's awesome. That is awesome. Well, you know, I didn't think it was that low because I'd, I'd flown over the stadium before on as a wingman yeah. and uh, on the wing of, of a guy who later became a general. Um, and I was actually looking up at some of the buildings that we were going through at the university. I mean, he was really, it was in the F-100 and it was just really, uh, so I didn't think it was that low. I thought, well, gosh, you, you always, I mean, if you're going to do a flyby, you got to do, be down where people could see you and hear you. So, yeah. So, no, so what are... I'm hearing is in order for me to make general, I need to do a low flyby because that's two people, you and the other guy that made general <laughs> and, and flew low. Yeah. So you're yeah. telling yeah. me, sir, that yeah. I need to fly low on yeah. flybys. Yeah. That's what yeah. I'm hearing. On flybys. Yeah. Well, actually, that may be re the reason they have rules on flybys. No. <laughs> <laughs> you're the you, you always want to be the guy that the rules made for that's funny yeah yeah no that they, they are the, uh, the, the rules are there for a reason we used to drop in the 100 napalm and you know don't have napalm anymore and it's a bad weapon but we were still dropping napalm in the f100 when i was flying it and uh, we would drop it at firepower demonstrations and so when these Air Force ROTC guys would be at their end of their summer training someplace. They would have these air power demonstrations and we would come by in F-100 and drop napalm for them. And yeah. You know, just a, Sounds what, awesome. What, you know, and the guys are sitting in the bleachers. You come by and drop enough of them. You can, I mean, it gives them, it burns their face, get sunburned from them. You know? <laughs> so anyway, we rolled in and there's three of us dropping two cans each. And uh, so I'm I'm number three. Um, Lee drops and his are tumbling, but they but they don't get enough turns in and they don't they don't go off. So they're still tumbling when two comes in and drops his and his are delayed and hit hit the first guys and they have a double, then I come in and drop mine for oh. three three drops of napalm within a split second of each other. 
And even though they're offset just a little bit from the stands, you think they're all one solid line of fire. And the uh, the guy that was controlling us on the ground, he just thought it was awesome. He thought yeah. that we did it on purpose, you know. It scared us to death. I'm telling you, it looked like the whole earth was skirt, scorched down there <laughs> with, a, with the napalm that was dropped. That awesome. Obviously, off the, uh, the, the, the guys on the stands loved it. They, they thought that, it was all interesting. Yeah, it was is, fun. Matt, you're doing manual deliveries, right? There's manual no, it's just delivery. mill, yeah. mill, you know, dr cranking oh, yeah. in the mills. Cranking in the mills and, 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 uh, Drop it on the pickle, yeah. And then, so transition to the A7, was it an in-house transition or did they send you off to a TX course? Well, some, a little of both. Some guy, it, depending on how many hours of, of fighter time you had, whether you would do a local checkout or do a, a checkout down there. You, you remember at the time when we were checking out, they didn't have a two-seater, uh, A7. So our first flight was single seat. So you, we would have, we went to Tucson, and you'd get two or three flights. How much it was? Maybe six. I don't know. Maybe it's more than that. But the first one was was single seat. Wow. Chase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you flew a lot of just local patterns then did a little bit of range work and that was about it was it one of those things where you're, you're you already are ready you're prepared you know it's just another jet or were you a little nervous going single seat first time out the gate you know what it was it it was an easy airplane to fly Man. it was really comfortable the a7 is a very stable platform um didn't like it being i wasn't crazy about how wing airplanes but it it did okay uh, provide a lot of shade for you when you were <laughs> just sitting around waiting on the ramp, but but it was it was a very stable airplane. Yeah. It wasn't very pretty to look at, um, yeah. but but um, the moving map display in it was was really good. Uh, the the GPS was pretty good and and improved the whole time we were there. So um, you you couldn't get lost in the thing. Had great range on it. Our mission in NATO, we we flew out of RAF Wittering Air Force Base, which was a Harrier base in England. We probably made, I don't know, six deployments over there. Um, really? Every every two years, I think, we would take the squadron and go over there, take our airplanes, ferry over, land. We usually have a local OR, practice ORI with the wittering wing, <clears throat> um, they would participate in some of it. We'd have our own operating area. They would provide the aggressors um, and uh, the base would shut down and we'd do that for two, three days. Then we'd just do some local flying with the Harriers. Um, most of us would get backseat rides in the Harrier. How'd you, how'd, how'd you like that? What was it like to hover a jet? Hover a jet, it is crazy. And it's just an unnatural <laughs> act, for one thing. Yeah. <clears throat> but have you ever, did you ever fly a Harrier? Did you no, ever no, fly against no. a Harrier? Uh, I have fought Harriers where they do the nozzle thing and you're just like, I don't <laughs> yeah. I don't know what, I'm just going to go up because I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> yeah. And then, and that's all he, it's all he can do is one turn and then he's done. But yeah. But, it, but to fly in it <clears throat> is just, Fantastic because you're sitting there and you crank up and you're on the taxiway or you're on an extended part of the runway and, and there's a truck parked down there, I don't know, 200 feet from here, whatever it is. And he's in power collision for takeoff and he says, Your eyes rolling. And there's a truck there. You, he said, oh, We'll miss him. Uh, got <laughs> right to that truck and we just went right just over it and went on in. That's you awesome. Know, when, when I was at at Alconbury, the this wittering is only about 10 minutes from Alconbury. They're right off on M14, right off the same highway. <clears throat> so we would go up to wittering all the time and watch them in their checkouts because they didn't have a two-seater Harrier at that time. And the guys would follow them in a Jeep, talking to them on a radio, giving them directions about 
what to do, how to take off, and then you see the jet wobbling, and he's yelling at him on the radio, <laughs> and we would follow the jeep or the, or the, <laughs> the ground chasing the guy, <clears throat> and he'd fly in the area of the air base, you know, just hovering, and wow, it, it was crazy. And then they'd come down and get a ride in the F four. It was a great um, exchange yeah. with those guys. Now I was gonna say, did you fight them in the A seven? Oh yeah. Yeah. How, how was the A7 for, for BFM? Was it a Yeah, you know, and we got those uh those uh auto maneuvering flaps that would prevent the airplane from departing, which really helped a lot. Um and it prevented you from over the airplane and it prevented it from going into a real violent departure. Uh, but before we got those maneuvering flaps, it it was uh boy, yeah. if you're going to depart an airplane. It is like completely tumbles your gyros um, and you, you wow. come out of it wondering, you know, am I right side up? <laughs> Where am I going? What's my airspeed? Because it usually knocks 50 knots off your airspeed or more, yeah. depending on what you were going into it on. <clears throat> so that that would be uh, quite a ride. Yeah. I was going to say that when, when we were in Wittering or when I was at Alconbury and flying the F4, was really the only time that I went Mach 2 in the in the F4 because it was a Mach 2.25 airplane. But, you know, you, uh, how many times did you fly the F-16 supersonic other than you might slip through it on an engagement or something if you're out over the water, blah, blah, blah. But I didn't realize they wanted us to all know what a, the profile to go through to get up to Mach 2. I don't know where I was would ever have the situation to have enough gas to go through the profile to get to Mach 2 because it is one hell of a profile yeah. of going through all these different drag profiles that you go through in different <clears throat> climb up and you then you come back down and you accelerate to this Mach and you go back up. And we would do it out over the North China or North uh, uh, North Ocean, uh, uh, north of uh, England. Get up to Mach 2 in my my uh, ramp, one ramp closed and allowed supersonic air to get in the engine. And so it compressor yeah. stalled. Yeah. And went into a skid, obviously, because I had to start pulling it back. And the poor navigator in the back seat is slammed up against the canopy, <laughs> sliding along, and he has no idea what has happened. <clears throat> and he can hardly talk, but he's asking me, you know, what, what's going on? What are we, am I going to eject? I said, no. <laughs> not not going to eject. One thing I could tell you, just hang on. We'll just slow it down. You had to slow it down. And the engine, I thought the engine was about to come apart. You could hear it really banging and popping. <clears throat> and it just the, the ramp closed that uh, allowed supersonic air in. Got it back. I'd shut down the engine, got the engine back and, and recovered. Had a little bit of damage to it, but uh, it was just a hydraulic failure on the ramp. That, oh, wow. Uh, Jeez. But uh, but pretty uneventful, you know. You're at an altitude and you're out over the water. Uh, what, yeah. Did I really know I was going Mach two, seventeen hundred miles an hour? I had no idea. Um, yeah, that's boogieing. That's boogieing. Was the A, the A seven pretty fast too, or no? No, just... no, no. A seven was a sub Mach. It was point nine nine, point nine eight. If if you're going straight downhill, full mill. We used to we used to chase. We did the uh, when they were testing the Tomahawk Navy was testing the Tomahawk missile down in the Gulf. We would fly the mission of chasing the Tomahawks down on the deck, and you talk about a fun mission. Yeah, that sounds awesome. You'd launch off of a, of a ship, and you'd you'd see the, the 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 blast of it coming off the ship, and then the missile would drop right down to 100 feet right then immediately. And if you couldn't pick it up on radar or anything, you had to keep your eye on it the whole time. And uh, it was easy to miss it. So you had to confirm to them that you had the missile in sight. Then we would chase it, and it would fly a low level across the water, and it had a target designated out there, a ship hull that they would have. Mm -hmm. And we would chase it across the, the water, and then... It would go into its attack mode. It would skid and offset, roll up, and roll in, and we would break off and watch it go through the hole of the ship and give them a report. Uh, 
I just can't tell you how much fun that was. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds it sounds awesome. Well, when you oh, went to okay. Europe, did you have <laughs> was it the same thing as the RF four where you had you knew your target and that's what you would practice? Yeah. Um, you knew your route and everything to right. get to, mm -hmm. but you this no, time it you was would, with bombs. But th that was your practice. But obviously, during during the operational exercise you would fly whatever target you were assigned. That was the ongoing yeah. war at that time. And you'd be, but you're, you're, you knew what your alert target was. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, and so this is in the, is it, are we in the seventies now? Are we still seventies? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Seventies into, um, through all the eighties. Yeah. We made a lot of trips over there in the eighties. I probably went three times in the eighties over there. When when you first got the jets, were they newer or were they mothballed as well? No, they they were uh, not mothballed. No. I think our jets came from Tucson. The A seven was at Tucson. That's where the schoolhouse was. And A sevens were coming off of active duty, and the uh, the guard took over the training program down there at Tucson at the yeah. Tucson International Airport. So how long did you end up flying the A seven? And during this whole time, are you doing your law practice as well? Doing my law practice and, um, you know, move up from a fight commander to ops officer to the squadron commander. You know, as long as you go through. Really? And, so you were the you were the squadron commander, uh, part timer in the A seven. Yeah, we 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 had a policy that uh, your part timers would hold most of the command positions. Really, I, that's a good policy because. Part-timers understand part-timer problems, I think, a little bit better well, than full-timers. And it, and it kept you moving through the system. You don't, you didn't stagnate. You you needed to look. My policy was that you would stay in a job three years at the max four, but you would be looking to what your next job was going to be. If you were going to go to Stana Val from being the ops officer or the scheduling officer or whatever you were doing, um, then you needed to have that in mind and you would move on. Fortunately, my track took me to the squadron commander and then the wing commander, uh, and then um, on to the commander of the Oklahoma Guard for a period of time. When did they transition to the F-16? 91 or 92, something like that. Where were you at this point in your career? I was, I was in PACAF. I was the, um, Reserve component deputy commander of PACAF to the commander of PACAF. So my drills were in Hawaii. It was tough.